welcome to Season 6, Episode 241 of School Librarians United. I am your host, Amy Herman. This podcast is dedicated to the issues and challenges school librarians face every day. As a school librarian starting my 17th year, I knew I wanted a podcast which addressed the nuts and bolts of running a successful library program. I don't claim to have the answers, but I hope that this is a platform to share resources and exchange ideas. Now is a perfect time to mention that all the ideas and opinions expressed in this podcast by myself, my interview guests, and listeners who reach out to the podcast are our own and do not reflect those of our school districts. When incorporating research, I always make sure to cite my sources. So whether you are a novice or a veteran school librarian, this podcast is something for you. I'd first like to give a shout out to Jen in Virginia and all the listeners who are tuning into the podcast during their long commute to work. My emotional support librarians, Amanda, Andrea, and Wendy, you know who you are. I'd also like to give a very special welcome this week to listeners Allison in Florida, Ashley, Jen, and Lauren in Georgia, and Beth in Texas. I welcome you and all listeners to reach out with your feedback and episode suggestions. You can reach me either on Facebook on X, formerly known as Twitter, my handle is at LMS underscore United, or the email address schoollibrariansunited at gmail.com. If you include your mailing address, I'll be sure to send you a podcast sticker. Be sure to listen to episode 224, I announce a new sponsorship with Literati Book Fairs. And now, a chance to hear from one of Literati's team members, Michael. Michael Morati, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Amy. You know, I'm dying to know because I'll be honest, I've never had a literati book fair. But, you know, could you tell us what are three things that you, as someone who supports librarians in their book fairs every day, what would you recommend to a school librarian to ensure a seamless and stress-free fair? Sure. So the first thing would be just be prepared for anything that might arise. We know things can get hectic with book fair week. So we like to keep our, our customers, our librarians prepared for when that book fair week does arrive. So one of the things that we see, for example, is we see a lot of schools have firewalls on their internet. Um, so that could be a difficulty when setting up our, our cash registers, which are smart devices. Our smart devices are really user friendly, but with any kind of technology, there might be some scenarios where we see some hiccups, especially with those firewalls. Um, so I would say get in touch with your IT department. We do send our cash register guides three weeks in advance of the book fair. And in those cash register guides, we have those items that need to be whitelisted in order for our registers to fully connect to your internet. So get in touch with your IT department and make sure that's all set up before your book fair really does start. Another thing I would say is get an understanding of what's popular in your school with your students. Um, what titles that you see in your book fair catalogs that you can find in our open book resources will be popular with your students and be prepared to put in a replenishment order for those items when your book fair does arrive. And then finally, I mentioned our open book resources. Get familiar with that platform, log into open book, check out our resources, use our principal materials for promotion of your book fair. And then also log in and, and watch our webinar videos. We have a few videos that that all our book fair coordinators like to watch before the book fair begins just to be better prepared. Well, and it sounds like it to me, like a lot of these things are sort of, you know, sort of that rookie, that, that, that first book fair that you host with Literati. And after that, you're not going to need to do these things again. You're not going to need to whitelist that, that register. You're not going to need to watch those orientation promos, but I, I'm grateful. I love a video. I love a little tutorial, a little hand holding. you know, I, I, I imagine you enjoy doing this. I, I, I'm really grateful that you're joining us here today. Can you give us an idea? What are some of the things that you love about working for Literati? Sure. Literati is awesome. Being in the book fair department is amazing. Just bringing that, that book fair into the schools, just feeling that nostalgic factor. When I was a student, book fairs was always an awesome day um, during the school day. So you just get to go in, check out the book fair. Bring your catalog with you. Circle the books that you are really wanting. You bring that home, show it to your parents. They're able to supply you with some money. You go to the book fair the next day and you're able to purchase some books. And I really like how Literati was able to take this book fair business and just bring to the schools in a new um, and improved and modern way. Fantastic. I hope you join us one more time. Thank you so much, Michael, for joining us today. I would love to, Amy. We'll see you next time. 
Friends, be sure to tune in and learn all about Literati and their generous offer. Librarians who book their very first Literati Book Fair for this upcoming school year and mention the code UNITED when booking may qualify to receive a $500 gift card to Tidal Wave. Visit the link in today's show notes and call the Literati team today to see if you qualify. And now a word from our sponsor, Capstone. Capstone is an innovative publisher and education technology provider of children's content for school libraries, classrooms, and at-home learning. Home of the award-winning PebbleGo Research Database, Capstone has a passion for creating inspired learning and intellectual curiosity in children, and I'm so excited to be working with them. I'm also grateful to Capstone for their continued commitment to support the podcast in Season 6. They are offering listeners of School Librarians United a very special discount. Visit shop.capstonepub.com and use the code UNITED to get $20 off an order of $100 or more for both print and Capstone interactive ebooks. That's code UNITED for $20 off an order of $100 or more for both print and ebooks on shop.capstonepub.com. And now for our episode, Role as District Director, and my conversation with Patricia Alvarado. Patricia Alvarado, welcome to the podcast. Hi, Amy. Thank you for having me. I am so grateful you're here today, friends. We are so incredibly lucky. We are going to learn so much about a job for which I have very little appreciation. I am fascinated and ready to be absolutely just gobsmacked by the the expansive job that you have. So, Patricia, would you f- let listeners know what is your current role? Sure. I am the director of library services in Dallas Independent School District in Dallas, Texas. Friends, I'm going to be completely honest. I don't think I have yet to interview anyone who oversees as many libraries as Patricia does. And so I, I'm very grateful that she's here today because it really does. Uh, I, I want to answer some questions and, and so I can better appreciate the experiences that librarians have whether they're in, uh, they're in schools or they're working in academia, or in this case, Patricia is overseeing those school libraries and those librarians. So, you know, Patricia, could you share with us uh, your current role as a district director? Sure. So I'm the director of library services. We have about 230 physical libraries across the city. Um, We have 141 elementary schools, 36 middle schools, 37 high schools, and another 26 multi-level schools. So it is a big district. We have 142,000 students. We have an amazing superintendent and an amazing vision, and I'm just so happy to be here in Dallas. My two uh, grown children graduated from Dallas ISD. I'm a product of public schools. I love public schools in Texas. And I love being in Dallas ISD. I love the diversity. I love what we stand for. I love our mission. I love that we're library strong here. Oh, I, I'm so, again, I, I'm, and friends, I'll tell you what. Um, I have worked in districts with one high school, maybe two high schools. The biggest district I worked for had three high schools. And so I, I am trying to just sort of wrap my brain around how many people are, are part of this entity, you know, I'm going to ask because there are definitely people who are tuning in right now who would like to know, you know, prior to becoming a district director of libraries, would you give us an idea of what experience did you have in school libraries? Sure. Well, uh, if we go way back, I was a young mom and my daughter was in kindergarten in Westoso ISD And my very first experience with a school library was as a parent volunteer. I remember shelving some books for Ms. Teresa Fernandez, who's no longer with us. And she was the librarian in this little uh, early childhood campus. And I saw her do a story time. And I thought, that looks like a lot of fun. I think I want to be a librarian. You know, I wasn't a teacher. I didn't have a college degree. I was a young mom. And I remember being at recess with my child's teacher. And I told her this. And she's like, Oh, so you're going to get a master's in library science? I'm like, wait, what? What's that? (laughs) You need a master's in library science to shelf books? And so I am very patient with that question. 
I don't feel demeaned by that because I understand why people would say that. But I, I just thought I want to do that. I want to have that experience with students. So that is my first experience in school libraries. And I did. I became a bilingual teacher. I worked in Corpus Christi ISD. Then I, um, I moved to North Texas. And my first job in North Texas uh, about 15 years ago was at a school in Dallas ISD. Eladio Martinez Learning Center, and I was a librarian there, and I thought I was in heaven. It was the most beautiful library I had ever seen, and the the principal was supportive, and I just had a blast. And then I decided to give it a shot at middle school. I went to L.B. Stockard Middle School, and I just remember one day just having a thought. Um, students were asking me some questions, and I think I thought, I am doing exactly what I want to be doing. I am really happy. I have the best job in the school, and it was such a good feeling. I was getting asked, I think, a research question. And I thought, I, you know, I like knowing information. I like being an expert in this. So um, I do have, you know, background in bilingual teaching and then uh, school libraries. And then I was given an opportunity by the director here in Dallas. And I became a coordinator uh, a few years after that. Um, I went and worked as a director in Irving ISD of digital learning and learning resources. And then I was, I came back after well, uh, the director in Dallas ISD retired. So that's what brought me here. It's been a long journey, but it's been one that has been very positive. And I just, I mean, libraries are near and dear to my heart. I love what they do for students. I love the equity they represent. I've always said before equity became a buzzword for people, it was what we stood for in libraries. And I'm really proud of that. I've said repeatedly that no experience we have is ever wasted. And, I, and I'm sure that you call upon those experiences that you had, those early experiences as you go, you know, about your day because, you know, sort of been there, done that. You, you have, when you talk to elementary librarians and middle school librarians especially, you have a, a much richer uh, appreciation for what it's like. Patricia, I'm so curious because after you told us about just how many elementary schools and middle schools and and high schools you have, you also mentioned another category of school. And I can't let that go because I want to find out what is it, what other types of, of educational establishments do you oversee? And in, and in what case, how are their libraries perhaps different than what I think of more the traditional arrangement of elementary, middle, and the high school? They're very traditional, but they have different grade bands. So a multi-level school would be something like a pre-kindergarten through eighth grade or a sixth grade through 12th grade. We have all sorts of unique schools. We have single gender schools. We have project-based schools. Um, we have IB campuses. So every campus is like a signature campus. They have something that makes them unique. And that's what's so fun and exciting about the libraries because the libraries will adjust to what the campuses need. So a pre-K to eight campus is going to need a lot of uh, materials for the early grades, but they're also going to have to use selper shelving for where our older students go to get some, you know, some young adults, some uh, books that might be of interest to them, you know, big chapter books that our little ones just are never going to pick up. So a lot of um, modifications, accommodations, but traditional services and what we offer. You know, I, I know that you have experience as a bilingual teacher. And I imagine you have very strong bilingual collections in within your your library collections. Can I ask, what do you feel is best practice when it comes to supporting our students and facilitating access? Do you feel that interfiling the uh, the the books that are in another language alongside their English counterpart? Or do you feel that your students are better served by moving those books into a collection which is exclusively one language versus another? I think it depends. We have some schools that interfiling is the only way to go because our students are in a dual language program and all students are going to have access to those books. But we have some schools that do not have a lot of second language learners. So we say, well, we can interfile some, but we want to make it to where it's available for the students that want to get this language and they can easily find it. So we leave those type of decisions to the librarians because they are professionals. Um, they know their campus, they know their demographics, they know what's going to work. 
So we try to give proper guidance and proper support. But at the end of the day, we recognize that our librarians are boots on the ground. They're gonna advise us as to what works for them. Okay, so I wasn't gonna ask you this question because I didn't want to offend you, but I was worried because I've never had a director. Uh, I've never worked in a, a school district that had a director that over, oversaw what we did. We had a department chair, but that's not the same thing. And, and part of me was very curious how I would work having a director because I am a very, I, and I think a lot of my listeners right now are thinking this too, very independently minded. I have very strong feelings about how the library I work, work in works and how I believe it works best. And I would be very concerned about having a, a district director who might impinge on my ability to make decisions that I feel are in the best needs of my students. I think it sounds like you have found a way to offer the librarians in the Dallas Independent School District the autonomy to make those decisions for their individual libraries. Well... You know, I tell my staff because I have professional staff and I have support staff in at the central level. We are not supervisors. We're not telling campuses what to do. We are here to train. We are here to coach. We are here to support. We are here to guide. But at the end of the day, we are here just as a partner. We're not here as a supervisor. Librarian supervisor is their campus principal. That's who they have to work with. And campus principals have autonomy. They know their community. We have more than 240 square miles in Dallas. What works in East Dallas is going to be different than what works in West Dallas. What works in North Dallas is going to be different from what works in South Dallas. One of the few things that we have to be a little more specific and directed with is our board policy. Following board policy for the collection development, for the selection criteria of our books. Um, even then, there's some interpretation uh, that needs to be done, but those are the kind of things that we do have to abide by what the board says and what's in policy, and we do, and we train and teach on that. But the administrative parts, the the what the librarian strengths are, we want to tap to their strengths. We don't want to limit them because we feel that this is best practice. So I think that's that's really important to me that our librarians see us as a partner in doing the best that we can, the best programming, the best services, the best resources for our students. Thank you so much. I, I think that it gives us a better sense, especially for those of us who will never be working in large districts like, like Dallas. You know, I think it's worth mentioning at this time that you do oversee a staff. The Dallas Independent School District Library Media Services Department which you oversee has its own staff. And for those of us whose districts do not have directors, would you give us a sort of behind the scenes understanding um, in what way does your staff support the many librarians? And I think we need to tell listeners right now, you're not recording from some cushy office. Friends know that I'm recording in uh, my childhood bedroom. Would you give us an appreciation of where, because you are at work, but it's not your office. So let's start with that, please. Sure. So today we had a lot of books that we're putting together for some um, distributions that we're going to have. We have different scheduled distributions. And so we don't just circulate materials. We also get federal funding for us to do book giveaways to increase students' home libraries. And so I wanted to come over here because we got a lot of deliveries. And I wanted to look because I get real excited just to see the kind of things that we have. Um, the kind of books that we're going to look at. So I go and read them and I make sure that it just, it help, helps me to feel still connected to what's happening in the campuses. But our central staff, our Irve staff, because our um, warehouse is located in downtown Dallas, they are our support staff. And so uh, these are library supporters, a warehouse manager and a, a cataloger, shipping and receiving clerk. What they do is they process our books. So we get, a librarian puts in the order, and actually, the librarian just makes the list. We put in the order. We take care of the funding. We take care of everything. And then the orders come here. We count the books. We make sure everything is put together. And then we send it to them already checked in, shelf ready. 
So our goal is always to support the librarians so that they do not have to use valuable instructional time for clerical or administrative works. Our goal is to support them for programming. We want to free up their time because they have a very unique set of skills and talents and things that they need to be doing. And so I don't want them using their time on things that we can support them with. So that's what our central uh, support staff does in our warehouse here in Dallas. Do you have a union catalog? I mean, do you have a, a catalog and you can see everything in the district, meaning when those boxes arrive at the various libraries you're supporting, those are like shelf ready? They are. Once it was so the librarian puts in her order and, you know, a few weeks later she gets it um, to her campus and they're ready for her to shelve. She can display them. She can do whatever she wants. Everybody has different uh, different things that they like to do with their new books, um, but they're ready for them. Absolutely. So that's that's definitely a big service that we have when we transition from librarian, when we've had some, you know, weather incidents, we had a tornado that knocked down a couple of schools, um, you know, so we support in so many special projects. We do inventory to help our librarians as well. Um, we support, um, to, we have technical support services at the campuses training automation system support that we need to give them and for our professional staff we have a coordinator and a couple of instructional specialists and a project manager we do um, coaching we do campus visits we do instructional support because it's important to know that while we are really large and big we still have to make the librarians feel seen and heard just because i'm in dallas doesn't mean nobody's ever going to know who, who we are so at our um, back to school training, we took pictures of every single librarian. We're working on a directory so that we can have that in place. And we, it's really important for me to know everybody's name, for me to be able to communicate with everyone, because while we're large, we still, we still serve the individual. And it's important that we know each other and that um, it's, it's a, a casual um, environment where they can reach out to me, where I can answer their emails. And I do, I get a lot of emails from the librarians. My my um, coaches and the camp the staff that I have here uh, does as well. That's we're we're here for them. That is our job. I, I'm just blown away because I've never worked with any. I've never worked in this type of arrangement before. It, it seems like I, I've just had to figure so much on my own because somebody like you didn't exist in my life. So can I ask just because I know people are wondering. Who decides the budgets of each of these building libraries? Is that still something that's established locally by the administrator in that building? Actually, that's done by the Board of Trustees, and the budget gets passed every year. So we have an allotment for print books and audiovisual, and it's, um, it's per student. So it averages out to almost $10 per student. So if I have 1,000 students, I get a $10,000 a year budget. You know, and so it's something that we're probably going to be looking at because books have gotten more expensive. Um, we're getting charged more, more fees. So that's something that we reevaluate. And if we have a recommendation, we make it so that that can be increased. But it's very, um, it's very consistent um, and is very equitable because we do give uh, the amount per student. So smaller schools get a smaller budget and larger schools get a larger budget for print books. But it's per capita. So, and, and I mean, for me, like that whole, you, you said equity again. That's going to, friends, it's going to be our new drinking word. Every time it's, you just cross it off your bingo card and then take a drink every time Patricia says equity. But that's fascinating because even within, like, I, I would work in a district uh, I, several districts ago where even within the seven libraries that I was working in, each principal had a different idea of how much money the librarian was going to get to spend in that library, even though they were comparable in, in size. And it was very telling. And I'm not going to lie, it caused some tension between some of us whose principals were more generous or their PTOs were more generous. And, and I was very aware that there was a certain amount of unfairness about some of the buildings whose, whose leadership may have allocated funds differently or prioritize the library, say, lower than, say, another building within the same district. And it was just that that kind of like tension is not beneficial to anybody's, you know, in terms of working together. So I'm really curious to know, do you even have department meetings? Like, 
how many school librarians work for the Dallas Independent School District? And like, do you ever all get together as a group? We do. We got together and are back to school because we are so large. We had to split it up uh, in a few days. So the district is kind of split up in regions. And so the librarians go to the training in regions. October, in October, we're going to have an open invitation at the Dallas Public Library in downtown Dallas. And they're closed on a Monday, but we're going to be there. We're going to take up their building and they have a lovely library. And so we're going to see 100 plus librarians that day. Uh, we're going to offer a lot of training, coaching. We're going to have a little vendor fair so that um, their book orders will be due within a few weeks after that, um, just so they can see what's out there, what's new. And we're going to have a lot of fun. Logistically, it is hard to get all the libraries together. So we do split up our training and we do kind of a little hybrid. We do have about two in-person meetings a year and then the rest are virtual. Again, we see our librarians pretty frequently because we do a lot of campus visits and we make sure that we are where they where they need us. But the training can be just so much fun, lots of synergy. And we do surveys. What is it that they want to learn about? What is it they're interested in? And that's what we tailor our professional development around. Again, the scale, I'm just trying to wrap my head around that. Please understand, and listeners know, know this already, I'm the only librarian in my district. If I want to see another librarian, I physically have to go to a conference to see another librarian. And uh, yeah, I can go months without being in another room with a librarian. So I, again, it's just, I'm just blown away by this. You know, friends, I'm going to be completely forthcoming uh, because I am my district's only school librarian. I'm so envious of the librarians who work for the Dallas Independent School District you know, I'd love to have a team supporting me in so many different aspects of my day. And it seems like your team has thought of everything that we're going to need to make sure we not only do we provide professional development, but you provide all of that support when it comes to the you know processing of the books. And, you know, I imagine ordering I, it what I'm sure your libraries go through renovations I imagine you're part of that process as well. We are. We have some standards that we put together. And because there's so many campuses, we have um, special funding. It's called bond funding, uh, which is taxpayer supported um, funding of building new schools. Dallas is an old city. We have old schools that need to be, um, you know, torn down and rebuilt. And so we put the specs together for that. We take care of the opening day collection. And that's another way that we really support at the central level. And we make sure that um, the facility is in a way that really enhances learning and instruction. So they always have us there as advisors. You know, I appreciate that as a district director, you can streamline and centralize a lot of processes like purchasing and digital resources, too. So now I'm really curious, do all of your schools, let's let's talk about like your digital resources. I appreciate that your print resources will probably overlap, but in many cases are going to reflect the sort of individuality and the needs of the different school communities in each of the buildings. But when it comes to like your digital resources, I, I have to imagine that a district as large as yours should be able to get a fairly competitive rate for digital offerings. How do you handle those resources? Sure. Well, it, we're really fortunate because in the state of Texas, they put together this package that's available at the public schools and at higher ed, and it's called TextQuest for um, K-12. And it has a lot of wonderful resources. Um, Gale, it has Learn360, which is a video repository, it has teachingbooks.net, it has Britannica Education. But because we are so big here in Dallas, we want other resources. We also purchase EBSCO. We do that locally. We purchase World Book because they have their own list of great resources for our little. So we have different resources that we push. Everything that we offer gets offered at the district level. So every single student, 142,000 of them, every single teacher has access. We try to build in single sign-on because we recognize that um, the old way of doing it, where go to our library site, go here, go there, and it's six steps and we've lost the students. So by building single sign-on and making that a requirement with our, our vendors and our partners and putting it in a page where the students log in and every day, 
just makes the library resources so much more prominent and that much easier for students to access. So we have a lot of equity in our resources. Everyone's using them, but it doesn't, it's not just about offering them. This is where our librarians are so crucial. It's about training in the use of them. It's about offering professional development for our teachers, for our curriculum writers, for the staff at central office, because they just, we don't even have to sell them. They really sell themselves. They're so good and so valuable. They're um, aligned to our state standards, which is just so helpful. And they're such high quality, you know, so our students love it. Um, we, we, we constantly focus on promoting our digital resources. Our ebook platform is at the district level. So there we had to make a couple of choices. Do you want to offer the ebooks at the campus level and give the librarians the autonomy, which absolutely we did. However, um, we recognize that it would be, um, it just makes, it makes more sense to offer it at the district level. But what we do use to still give the librarians and the campuses what they need is we still use their list and we use the list that they use for their orders to put in our digital platform and in our digital shelf. So it's still a representation of what they're putting together. Well, and I, I think what's really interesting is because I, I imagine, like everywhere, families will move around around the, the Dallas metro area. And because one district is supporting them, that you have that continuity, that families will move around and, and still be in the Dallas Independent School District. Uh, you know, in Metro Detroit, uh, if I drive a mile in any direction, I'm going to be in somebody else's district. I have to re-enroll my students in a, in a different district, which is, you know, jumping through hoops. But also, when you talk about that learning experience, they're going to be, all of a sudden, that's very disjointed because the students are going to be going to a different district, whereas... Th they're just going to be in an extension of the Dallas Independent School District. Yes, we try to make it so standardized because we do have a large percentage of our population that is transient. They move around, they live in apartments and they move, you know, just five blocks and now they're in a different school zone. So um, it's really important that they learn how to navigate um, the online resources. And that's one of the main responsibilities of our librarians at the elementary level as well, because it'll travel with them all the way through high school and even college. You know, you were talking a little bit earlier about how the Board of Education really is this sort of umbrella, which sort of the policies established by the Board of Education apply across the entire district. But I'm wondering, you know, let's let's talk a little bit more about procedures and policies. So I'm thinking that your team is responsible for centralizing the procedures and policies that are implemented in the libraries. And by which I mean, like, when we're talking about things like checkouts and overdues and late, I mean, all of the, the sort of uh, the business end of being a librarian. I'm so curious because when we talk about equity, how are the policies and procedures in your individual libraries sort of being uh, sort of consistent across the district as a whole? Well, we do follow our board policy. And in Texas, you have two types of policies. You have local and you have legal. Every single school district in the state has the same legal board policy. You know, one of the things that it says in board policy that we cannot restrict students' First Amendment right to information. And... Um, but it also says that we have to be age appropriate in the materials that we put, that they cannot be pervasively vulgar or other things. So every single school district in Texas has that. But we create our own local policy and it's at the it's at the advice of, you know, the, the designee. I would be the designee for the board of trustees when it comes to library services. So it can take it's a long process. It can take a year sometimes to really update board policy in a manner that suits our district. It cannot supersede legal policy, but the board just tells us pretty much what they want. And we in the department determine how we're going to do it. So we don't have a lot of restrictions. For example, we do not charge any type of fees for our students. If they have a late book, we're not going to charge them a penny for it. You know, um, even a lost book, we hope that they return it. But it's really important for us not to focus on the materials and instead focus on the student. For some librarians that might be a little more careful about their collection, that might not be something that they want to hear. 
but it's really important that they understand that it's our students' parents who are paying taxes who provide the money that we get every year for our books. So a lost book is not the worst thing that can happen. I, uh, I appreciate hearing that from somebody who, who has an impact across so many libraries in Dallas. I have to ask you, you know, would it surprise you that I reference the Texas reading lists when I'm putting together my purchase order? They're extensive and, and they're great lists to go off of, friends. I've included a link in our show notes today because, friends, I regularly visit these lists when I am fortunate enough to have some money to spend and, and to purchase books for my own collections. I'd love for you to give us a, a, an idea of what the Dallas Independent School District has done to enhance this list, which is shared across Texas. Sure. Well, we have the Texas Library Association, just a strong organization in our state, puts these lists together. Some of our librarians are part of those committees, and they take a whole year, and they read tons of books. One I'm really proud of is the Luminarias list, which is a Spanish language list that I think since 2008, the Dallas librarians kind of got together and said, hey, we just don't have enough authentic language titles, and our students speak Spanish, so they started vetting books and reviewing them and reading them and putting a list together. We have all of those on our website. That's a very good list. Sometimes if you see more translated books there, it's because the publishers did not publish enough good Spanish titles and we just didn't feel comfortable putting them in there. But overall this year we had a lot of good things to choose from and it's such a fun group. I'm actually a part of that group and I just love the the different voices that we have for picking um, these books. We use the, the Blue Bonnet list. We use the Tatia's list. We use just so many there because they're wonderful. And, you know, most of our librarians will order, say, a, a whole set of the Blue Bonnets, but some of them will go through it. They'll read the reviews. They'll put what they want and they'll put them there. But it's always nice to have that guide. I love this. I And I've got to ask, and I'm putting you on the spot. Do you have a vendor? Because these are Spanish language books. That isn't always a given, being able to find a vendor who can consistently provide not just world language books, but ones that are, are translated well and, and are very accurate to and, and respect the language that the book is, is written in. Can you give us any sort of lead on a supplier that you use? And I, I, I'm only asking because when people look at this list, they'll, they'll ask you also, do you have a vendor that you would recommend using uh, regardless of the size of a, of a purchase? Well, we do use jobbers for some of our Spanish materials. We use some limited market book vendors. And I do hesitate to say uh, just because we have, you know, it's very competitive. But, you know, we use things like, like and it's okay, like Follett, like Mackin, like Children's Plus, um, Permabound, or, you know, those are our, our general jobbers and vendors. And for the specific type, and they pretty much can get us any Spanish materials. But we do have to search sometimes high and low for the, actual books, and then they'll get them for us. I love it. So it's a great list. And again, you know, we, librarians, I, I put so much value in a list that's been curated by librarians. I trust us implicitly. And so friends, be sure to check out that link in the show notes. Like many communities in the United States, Dallas school libraries and librarians have been responding to the challenges being raised by community groups, as well as national organizations. As the director of libraries, what have you done to support your librarians? And what have you done to help keep the books on the shelves? I tell our librarians and I tell our students and I tell everybody that wants to hear this, we do not ban, we do not censor. We respect our students' First Amendment right to information. That being said, we follow board policy and board policy talks about age appropriateness within the grade bands. There have been times that a librarian orders a book at the middle school and she, she recognizes maybe this should be better off at the high school and we move it to the high school. Um, there have been times that maybe a book is not what um, needs to be at the high school, but our students have direct access to the Dallas Public Library where they can get the titles that they need. But to really support the librarians and to make them feel confident is we in what they're doing, we train them on best practices in collection development. We train them on board policy as it pertains to selection criteria. We train them on using professional reviews and when in doubt, read the book. 
you know, we can't do that for every single book because we don't get paid to sit and read our books as much. I mean, that would be a dream job. <laughs> but that's not what we that's not what we do, unfortunately. But we use professional reviews. Some of our librarians are professional reviewers themselves. So sometimes if somebody's insisting, um, hey, I really think this book is, is appropriate. I know it says this, but I think it's that. OK, as long as you read the book, do you think it's a good book? And is it OK? And if it gets challenged, will the board policy um, be sufficient. Like we don't defend books themselves. We defend the process that we that we um, took to create these lists because and you know this, Amy, you can't possibly read every single book. So what is the process? Well, the process is I followed our board policy and the board policy says that I can't restrict based on ideas and based on information, but it has to be age appropriate. You know, it has to have literary merit. You know, it can't be uh, something that does not add value to the collection. And for some, that can be very subjective. But overall, we have so many resources. So, you know, we have School Library Journal. We have Carcass. We have our own professional librarians. And that's the advantage of having so many here because someone somewhere will have read the book and they can write a quick write-up and tell us what is it that they recommend and what is it that they do. So just lots of training and so they can feel confident that, they're ordering within the bounds of policy without being too restrictive for information and for ideas and for social situations that students might find very beneficial in a fiction or nonfiction text. I'm thinking right now about that category of schools you were talking about, which have multi-age, multi-level. And, and can you share what has been the Consistently, what has been the successful approach to organizing a collection in such a way that our youngest readers in that uh, school and the oldest readers are able to search for books confidently, but also know that they're going to be working, they're going to be coming in to have the most access to the books that really are intended for that readership? I think for those mixed level schools, um, they're kind of divided by space or by zone. So we might have our easy, easy or everybody books is what we call them in one area. And this is where my kinder students and my first grade students are going to go. But my eighth graders are going to go to these other shelves. Maybe they're a little higher. Maybe they're a little taller. And that's where I'm going to have my fiction books, my chapter books, some YA in there. So the, we kind of divide by space. The librarian, you know, just like you know probably your collection like the back of your hand, the librarian would know the collection as well. So when she's having a story time with the little, she might be where their books are. When she's doing circulation or a research lesson with our middle school students, she'll be in a different side. So it's just like a, a simple division and it's just something that she would know. She or he, I'm sorry, or they. of your schools use Accelerated Reader? That's a, a very uh, contentious topic for, for some people. But what has been the approach for the Dallas Independent School District? It's uh, campus autonomy as well. Out of the 140 elementaries, we probably have two that use the Accelerator Reader program. They have very high circulation. They have high reading rates. I'm not um, inherently opposed to it. I don't believe we should label our books. And, and if actually, that's not allowed. Um, by the the reading, you know, um, the reading level. I don't I don't believe that's good practice. But, you know, we teach our students how to use the catalog so they can go and find the books that they read. And we make sure the librarian understands and lets the teachers know, hey, even though you're reading at a fourth grade level and your teacher says you got to get a fourth grade level book, you can get whatever book you want and a book at the fourth grade level because you can check out more than one book. You know, you can check out five books if you want. So we, we give the campuses the autonomy that they need. We, we do make sure that the students' privacy is still protected by not labeling the books on the outside. I noticed that you have an online card catalog, obviously. Do you have an, a way to interlibrary loan your print materials between your many schools? We do. And I mean, last year we had 4,000 transactions. So it's like I tell the students, it's like a big Amazon store. If your librarian does not have the book, you can request it from another campus and it'll come to you in a couple of days. So it's wonderful. We have Motorpool. They take care of everything. So that's not even done through here. It's done through the drivers at the warehouse. And so the request goes in. The librarian sends it in, a, in an envelope, you know, in a brown envelope. And then it gets put in a pile for that campus. And it takes a couple of days to be received at the next campus. So it's wonderful. I do... 
caution because it does take some time for the library to pull these books. And I tell our librarians, if your students are constantly requesting books from other campuses, then order those books. <laughs> so just make sure that you have the fun ones and the popular ones. And if you don't want to share those books, then they, they have little tricks in the back end to put them on reserve or something. But we want to make sure that um, a lot of the, the interlibrary loans are actually for teachers. They want a professional book that somebody else has, so they want this book that somebody else has. So um, a lot of them are actually done by adults. Well, and I, I know that I worked for a district where we had interlibrary loan, and but we also were connected at our our cat. We had a union catalog with our public library, and regularly, many of our books were getting checked out not by students in our schools, but by patrons through the public library. And I'll be honest, as somebody who never had a budget more than $2,000 a year, the idea of losing the books, what few books I had to purchase every year to patrons outside of my school, that was really hard for me. And it was like, uh, you know, I, I think you're right. We have these little tricks. We're like, oh, sorry, we can't find that book. Oh, it's crazy. You know, I've been looking for that book. I can't find it. And then all of a sudden, it's mystery checked out to somebody in my building. <laughs> That's fun. Yeah. But librarians do Thank that. You. They do. We have, a, I mean, it, it, we have 1.8 million books. Oh, my gosh. I love when librarians curate and then share their resources. And I want to make sure that listeners know about the webpage that you have entirely dedicated to copyright. It is fantastic. And, and I, I very much appreciate this because this is a topic for which it's very hard for those of us without a larger district to support us to, to get all the, that information together. Well, we want to make sure, first of all, I do tell our librarians, you are not the copyright police, but because some of them will get so stressed out about it, but we do offer guidance. We do offer support. We do offer information. So every single teacher in the district is required to take a copyright course that we put together. So that's on our, that's on our back end. So that's not available here, but we do, it's a 10 minute course just about copyright, about best practices for copyright. And then this is what we put for the public and for anybody else that might be um, wondering about that, because we try to be honest and fair in our duties. We try to keep the law when it comes to making copies and, you know, ensuring uh, copyright guidance. We buy our swank movie licenses so that our librarians are able to show a movie after school. Or they're going to have some fun party or something. So we are a big district. We don't want to be a target for anybody. So we do try to ensure compliance. But I don't like, again, I try to keep the, the work that our librarians do to be part of programming and to be instructional. So we have this here so that they can say, hey, here's our page. Here's a link if you have any questions. But I, I don't want to make them the ultimate voice because I don't think they need that, that responsibility. And copyright can be such a gray area, too. Yes, and I, I've I've worked with I do I do work with some educators who are lawyers, and um, every once in a while I'll run a question by them. But it is there is enough nuance there that I, again you really want to make sure that the district has some you know concrete information that we can all point to and and at least be consistent in what we do. My day is spent supporting the needs of every person who enters my library. What does your day look like? Because you're working in a, a very different workspace. Give us an idea of what your day is like. Sure. I mean, it, it varies from day to day. You know, I like everyone else. I have to check my emails, but we do big picture stuff like strategic planning. What direction are we taking our libraries in? What are we going to do to improve our goals, our objectives? How are we going to determine priorities? You know, I do budget management. We do collection development. We polish, you know, our board policy. You know, there's a lot of things going on with um, this house bill and this and and that's now law in Texas. You know, how can we uh, better prepare our librarians for that? Um, we do a lot of technology integration. Uh, we supervise. You know, I su supervise my staff. You know, so I have one-to-one -one check in meetings with them. Who did you visit? You know, we have a lot of uh, standardization. And what did you think about this library? How can we support this librarian? Do we need to talk to the principal? Do we need to, you know, and sometimes we do have a central budget as well. Does this library, you know, I had a new librarian that came in this year and she said, uh, Miss Alvarado, I don't have enough fiction books. And I'm like, what do you mean? She's like, I'm a K, you know, K-5 school. I don't have enough fiction books. And I thought she was exaggerating. I thought maybe she was new and she didn't know. 
I don't know what happened. I don't know if the inventory was done wrong, but she did not have enough fiction books. So we gave her an extra $5,000 to add to her collection. Here you go, because we want your students to have fiction books. And we gave her some guidance. So uh, we do little projects like that and big projects across the district. Um, there's just always so much to do and there's never enough time to do it. But, you know, it's I'm grateful. I'm grateful to have this job. I'm grateful that um, this district supports libraries because our superintendent is fantastic and she does. I'm grateful that they have given us a voice as um, being part of the instructional team that really supports performance, student performance. And we, you know, we deal with community engagement. We deal with assessments. You know, how are we supporting? What are we doing with student achievement? Of course, we talked about this earlier, policy development. Right now we're planning for our October professional development day. So we're kind of polishing up those sessions, getting some speakers. We deal with author visits and who's going to come and what schools are we going to pick. You know, and also some crisis management. Like I said, we have some schools that get flooded or there was a tornado a couple of years ago. We had to redo two of our schools. So there's all sorts of things that happen. Overall, I mean, we manage operations at the district level, at the campus level. We keep a master spreadsheet and we just make sure that we are supporting the campuses um, the way they need to be supported to really be effective for our students. Something I hear consistently when I engage with school librarians, either through social media or through conversations like this, is how alone they feel. And I feel so alone. I feel so alone. And I was like, unfortunately, I can readily identify with that. I, I, I am, I, like I said, I, I have to get on a plane or get in a car to go find another librarian. And uh, it is very rare that I'll encounter another librarian on any given day, let alone week or month. I can't help but think that you are a constant advocate for not only the individual librarians, but for their their programs, for the fact that they have, that, that they exist. You know, I, I'll be honest, I, I have felt like my job has been on the chopping block. And because there's only one of me, I don't know if anybody would, would, would fight for, for me and my job if the board decided that I was no longer needed. It sounds like you would be absolutely in that librarian's corner making sure that that program is, stays intact and that it's staffed by a librarian. Because I really believe it, Amy. I believe that a school is more successful when they have a certified librarian. I believe that students, you know, we talk about interventions, we talk about tutors, we talk about this, but we're kind of missing the mark when we focus on that instead of intrinsic motivation for the students to pick up a book and read. It is so important for us to have book access, book choice for them because a lot of our students are not going to get on Amazon and find a book and they're not going to go to the public library. They don't have transportation or they just they're not comfortable or their parents aren't taking them. Their parents work two jobs. So access to books is so crucial. We do so much more than that, but that is foundational. And so I think I'm an advocate because an advocate because I, I really believe it. I'm not trying to save somebody's job. I'm trying to say we will be more instructionally sound if we have a certified librarian running the campus library, if we have these amazing programs that really motivate students to read, if we have technology in the library, if we have mo modern furniture that really, uh, you know, lends well to collaborative spaces so the students can feel welcome, so they can feel like, like they're at a Starbucks. I really believe that's part of what, uh, what we do here is if our students cannot have a 3D printer in their home, and not everybody does, but that's what we should have in our libraries. If our students can't afford a drone, but they see that that's what the cool thing that our kids are doing, we'll get a drone for them. We have drones in our libraries. We have 3D printers. We have laser machines, you know, so we're trying so hard to make sure that our students who are just as deserving as any student in the state gets what they need. And I love that we get the funding. I love that we get the opportunities and that we have a voice. There's so many others here in Dallas that want to support us, and they do. And and that's why I'm an advocate. I'm an advocate because I really believe that our librarians, look at you, Amy, you do this out of your own <laughs> heart. You're tired, you worked all day, but here you are filming and recording this podcast because you want to, because you believe in it. It makes me sad that, that you're alone or that you feel that sometimes, and I understand it, and it can be lonely 
for our campuses because we have so many, right? But it's really important that we reach out. I, I think your podcast is wonderful. It gets people different perspectives of what it's like. I know we have a strong program, but we have our challenges as well. And I think it's just important that we reach out to get support, to get help, to not reinvent the wheel. Well, what are they doing here? Maybe I can just get this list or I can get this idea. And that's what I love to do. I love to be on on Twitter or X or whatever we're calling it now and and um, really reach out to people that I admire, people that I think are, are great. And what are they doing? I mean, that's how I really generate ideas for the programs that we're going to have here. Patricia, I heard you mention a couple times your vision for your department. I'm going to be honest, I don't believe I have ever written a vision statement for any library I've ever worked in. I really am just focused on doing my job every day. And But again, if I had a vision, I, I, I would like to think I'd come up with something clever. But I would like to ask you, because... You have a vision statement for the Dallas Independent School District, and I, I'm hoping that you will share it with us and help us understand what types of things you would hope set the Dallas Independent School District apart from the rest. Sure. Well, we have a vision and we have a mission. So my vision is to be the leading school library system in the state, and even though we have resources, even though we have the students, we also have our challenges. And there's so many good libraries in Texas. Don't believe all the hype because I know there's a lot that's written on there. I'll read the newspaper. I'm like, well, that's not really happening, but this might be happening. We have a lot of support in our public schools and we have a lot of support in our libraries. Certainly in Dallas, we do. And I can speak for, for my district here. And I think that we can be because I think we're on the right track. I think we can be kind of like a, a guiding light for other districts and other campuses that want to ensure equity for their campuses. I've been in Dallas before, but, you know, I took um, I was in Irving ISD and now I'm back. A couple of I guess maybe last year, our, our chief of teaching and learning, so she, Dr. Shannon Trejo, right under our superintendent did some focus groups. She wanted to know how can we improve our services so that we can keep the libraries strong. So the principals can agree with me that uh, we need a librarian. Like we saw what was happening, that people were letting go of their librarians. So she did some focus groups with executive directors and then a separate one with principals, a separate one with parents and a separate one with librarians. And she asked, what services do you want your school librarians to provide? And so we came up with, they came up with four core principles. So I came right in just to implement the whole process. And it, we called it the standards of services. So they wanted librarians to help promote, create, establish a culture of literacy. They wanted librarians to be partners in literacy instruction. They wanted librarians to support inquiry and to support innovation. And they wanted librarians to support family and community partnerships. So those are our four standards of services. That is what we stand for. And everything that we do falls under one of those domains. And it has really helped us to narrow our focus so that we can say that what I am doing is purposeful. What I am doing is what my principal, what my executive director, what the chief of teaching and learning wants us to do because it seems like we had our idea of what was important and then the school had an idea. It seems like we were not speaking the same language and we had to speak the same language as principals because at the end of the day, they are the supervisors of the librarians. They are the ones that we have to convince that the librarians are doing a great job and they're being um, impactful. It has to lead to impact. So these standards of services is what we use as our guiding principles. Um, we updated our evaluation instrument. We updated our job description. We updated our graphics, our table calls. You know, we're really focusing on our standards of services. And so when libraries create their goals for their evaluation, they have to select two of the four. This is what we're going to do. And we have our meetings. Every single session falls under one of those standards of services. We wanted to make sure that we were clear and we were intentional about what we're doing because we are not falling by the wayside. We're as important today in 2023 as we've ever been. In fact, I heard somewhere that librarians, um, that this new generation, um, uh, I guess the Generation Z, that they use libraries more than the millennials um, did and more than the Generation Xers. So I'm thinking it might be an issue with resources, but we're not going anywhere. We just have to 
redefine how we move and how we present ourselves to others. We got to speak the same language because oftentimes we're doing what the principal wants us to do, but we're not saying it in a language that they understand. And we're, you know, we're, we're, we're promoting reading. We're doing what needs to get done, but we might use some of the AOA terms instead, right? And they're like, what does that mean? <laughs> so we got to make sure that we speak the language of education. And that's what I'm here for. I'm here to be that uh, liaison between the, the campus librarians, our central staff, the superintendent, and this is why libraries are crucial. This is why they're important. So um, that's what I do. I advocate for libraries because I truly believe in the impact that they can have in the lives of our students. Friends, that was a podcast mic drop. I seriously, Patricia Alvarado, I just, I cannot tell you how moved I am. I was just, and friends, I'm just sitting here listening and I could do this all night. The dedication, the passion, the commitment, and you want us to succeed. And I, I think we all deserve somebody like Patricia working for us on our behalf. Patricia Alvarado, you are amazing. You have made my day. I'm getting emotional. Would you please let listeners know how we can find you on social media? Sure. Because I was in Dallas before I became a director, uh, my handle is still D-I-S-D, librarian. And you can find our library department, D-I-S-D, libraries. Patricia, I know that your school year is well underway. The librarians at the Dallas Independent School District, they're in good hands and I am so excited that you were able to take some time out of your busy day to talk with us. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you, Amy. And I'm grateful to you because you're doing some great work connecting us all across the country and sometimes internationally with others so that people don't feel alone, so that they understand that there's a whole group of us that are really rooting for them. Have a fantastic night. Thanks so much. Thank you. If you found this episode helpful, please share it out with your team, your PLN, and on social media. Be sure to follow on your favorite podcatcher so you'll never miss an episode. And if you really like listening today, consider leaving a review wherever you listen to podcasts. Reviews help others find us. One last friendly reminder, friends, use the code UNITED to take advantage of Capstone's generous $20 discount off an order of $100 or more. And librarians who book their very first Literati Book Fair for this upcoming school year and mention the code UNITED when booking may qualify to receive a $500 gift card to Tidal Wave. Visit the link in today's show notes and call the Literati team to see if you qualify. The topic of our next episode will be our media virtual presence and my conversation with Amanda Chacon. I hope you will tune in.